happy to introduce Matt Meisner. He is the head of data analytics at FBN, and Hunter, who is our head of agronomy here, uh, here to talk about data science. But let's start with the agronomy, because it's so much more interesting. <laughs> Very <Of course>. biased. <laughs> So we just got we just wrapped up talking about the risk of 2019, the crop insurance in 2019. Obviously, big part of that risk, agronomy. Right. What happened agronomically in 2019? I think it's what didn't happen. Uh, you know, if you you look back maybe over the last 20 years, it's it's hard to find another year that was as challenging in terms of timing, planting season just you know dragged and dragged and dragged. All the decisions on switching, uh, not getting down your pre herbicide plans, like. There, there just wasn't uh, a circumstance that wasn't challenging from an agronomy perspective. I, I think guys, you know, continue to struggle through the rest of the year. It's just, you know, harvest is still lagging in some places. Uh, really, there isn't a playbook for a year like 2019. I'd say 93 was maybe the closest, and a lot of us, you know, weren't even in the ag industry at that point. Or, you know, you know, out of diapers or whatever. So it's, uh, you know, it was challenging, unbelievably. Let me run something past you. This is something I've, I heard from a couple farmers I was talking with recently. It's not just that people were kept out of the field. It's that they planted when it was wet. Root systems didn't get well established because there was so much water close to the surface. And then when there was dryness, talk about kicked when you're down, dryness later in the season. What's happening there? Yeah, I, I think that's been uh, a really interesting aspect just generally and crop breeding like there's been a lot of work towards getting these drought tolerant hybrids and basically that's just additional root mass scavenging for more water but you're like this roots need air to breathe so when it's saturated with water they don't they stay away from it those shallow root systems when it does dry off you just you're lost there's there's not you can't scavenge from the entire soil profile and the challenges that come with that are tremendous because you the additional disease pressures the susceptibilities that come uh, you know, on top of that drought, it just, it's just, it's, it's cascading issues at, at that point. So yeah, I mean, you want, honestly, during planting season, it'd be great to have a little dryness, you know, after, after you get emergence. And just, of course, we never had a break this year. How do we use data to make sure the roots go deeper? <laughs> do you sprinkle the numbers right on the top of the soil? Or? Can we use it as like a foliar application? I, I think it's 30 bits per, per, plant. <laughs> per plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That'll get it. <laughs> That'll get it. That'll, that'll take care of your root issues. But seriously, Matt, talk just a little bit. So the thing is, there's no way to prepare for the, these kind of eventualities on your own farm. Unless you've seen every year ever. Like, I don't know how you prepare for more things like this, but data science offers us a little bit of an out there. Wh what? Yeah, so I think one of the big benefits that we can learn through data on this is that if we have data from other farmers who have experienced weather conditions like this, that can help us identify practices that are you know, more resilient to bad weather, it might identify hybrids uh, for corn that are maybe more resilient to these kinds of weather stresses. And yeah, you're not going to have experience every possible weather condition on your farm because you can't, right? Your farm is only, only going to have a few decades of experience under its belt. But if you can aggregate that data from a whole network, which is really one of the core goals of FBN, uh, that's when you can you know, quickly learn from other farmers who may have experienced different growing conditions, how different practices work, what products you can use that might buffer yourself a bit against some of the, some of the extremes. Um, and we can also analyze, because we pull in all the weather data as well, we can analyze how different practices compared in the weather, right? We can see which hybrids were the most uh, most resilient in the bad weather, which, which products did well under which conditions, and that can help inform what products we might want to plant next year. Obviously, hopefully next year is much better, but if it's not, at least we're, you know, at least we have the option to see what, what worked well this year and prepare that way. What's your favorite thing to collect data on? And, and look at the data. I mean, what do you think is the most useful? Uh, what variable or what factor you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'd, probably for us, I think hybrid selection comes down to probably being the most important. Matching it up with soil types or the geography or all of the above? Yeah, I think all of the above. Uh, soil type is a huge factor and the, you know, which genetics are the best suited to which soils can vary a lot by, uh, vary a lot by the genetics. Like the best variety for one soil type might be totally different Right. the best one for another. Uh, but the geographic data matters too. Um, for example, a pro hybrid that's really well suited to drought tolerance or certain hybrids might be way more resilient to heat stress in the summer, right? So 
Um, with a big data set, you're able to pick out patterns like that and see, hey, when you had really hot nights in July for this hybrid, that really screwed up its yields, whereas this other one was pretty um, pretty robust to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, the seed is just such a big factor on the farm. You know, it's our, the biggest input cost, if not one of the top two or three for every single grower is growing corn and beans and thousands of products on the market, all with different prices, different traits, different growing characteristics. So I mean, in our in our experience, that's one of the ones where we see the biggest effect. It's another tool in the toolbox for the management of your farm. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. As opposed, I mean, it, it's always been a decision that people have taken seriously, but now we're able to leverage hundreds of millions of acres of data to make that decision. Actual data. Yeah, right yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. Data from real farms, right? Not right. data just from research plots right. or trials that, you know, are, is good, uh, but, but limited, right? Like trials can't cover every hybrid. They only get a couple of acres per variety of that, right? And um, the more data you have from the more growers, the more confidence you can have that the data's telling you something useful. Absolutely, yeah. Listen, I don't want to be the worst, but I've talked to the people at USDA, the head meteorologist there, and it the outlook for the spring is not optimistic in terms you of You are weather. the worst. <laughs> okay, it's fine. I'll be the worst. Um, how, what do we do? You two. <laughs> Solve it for we'll me defer now. defer to Hunter. Well, I, think, I think it started in November of last year. It's like, it, it won't, you know, there's no relenting on, on this weather issue. So, I again, I think we're in, in just unprecedented uh, times, but uh, you've got to plan the best you can. You got to plan with data, and then adapt. And I, I think that's you know that's modern farming is uh, being very ROI conscious, being very data driven, but being quick to react and, and make the adjustments when you can. And that's that's always challenging, uh, but that's the recipe for success. It just gotta gotta hang. I mean, you you can't not farm one year. I mean, you can't just take a year off. So gotta roll with the punches. What do you see for trends as far as how data has changed the way that guys manage their farms? Yeah, I think I think a really easy uh, thing to point to is precision planting and hydraulic downforce. A lot of research have shown it's uh, productive, but I, I think when you look back at the planting data, you just see that singulation, you see that even emergence when you come back, and that's something that just, to me, I think it's really improved our, our yield potential as a, you know, as national yields. I think that's a very strong component in this, you know, four or five year cycle of upturn. But I, I think at the very farm level as well, like there's just so much benefit. Uh, and, and to me, the, that's a data, that's a data uh, decision that folks make. So do you guys, you guys have data that shows that the, you know, that, that better singulation really translates into a yield, into an ROI? I, I think there's both the anecdotal and, and pretty hard evidence of that. Uh, I, you know, it, some of it comes down to just logistics, making sure you can move fast, uh, but, and, and almost some ease of use as well. I mean, not having to be thinking about what your downforce pressure is set to and those sorts of things. Sure. So, uh, but yes, it is, it is very clear that even plant spacing leads to higher yields and uh, that's, it gives you better ROI. That's, that's what you're there for. Hypothetically, say I was a farmer and professional YouTuber from Minnesota. <laughs> What would be your recommended data to watch going into planting? What, what do I need to check every day? Asking for a numbers. friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, you got to watch the weather. I mean, that's the only thing. And honestly, some of the long-term forecasts are pretty helpful. Uh, but at the same point, I mean, if you could, if you could get the seven-day forecast right, you'd, you'd be a, you know, you'd own the world almost anyhow. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very unpredictable. Uh, you just have to, you have to be mindful of the weather, uh, and you know, try to build a plan that's uh, something you can tear down and put back together as soon as things fall through. Matt, what data do we need to pay attention to? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the one of the ones that we track the most come planting is really planting temperature and looking at how it's soil temperature specifically, and looking at how uh, certain varieties have responded in the past to soil temperature. Uh, that's, we've seen some hybrids that are much more amenable to being planted a little earlier and others which are, you know, that's playing with fire. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, that's something that we track a lot and we have historical data on how thousands of products have responded to that in the past, which we can then leverage to predict how that might occur in the future and then track the soil temperature 
in near real time in the spring to see when we think it might be getting safe to plant. Well, and you guys have actually done some really interesting analytics around things like planting date. You know, say I'm a hypothetical Minnesota farmer you, slash YouTuber, and I'm like, I'll plant tomorrow, it's fine, I just really need to post this video today. That yeah. can really affect my yield. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the yield drop you can see from planting even just a couple days or a week later in a good year is, can be really dramatic. I mean, it can be several bushels over the course of a week or something, so. Yeah, that's why, especially like this year when we had really short planting windows, yeah. the pressure was even, even stronger to like, <laughs> we got to get this planted right away, or else we're, you know, we're we're leaving yield on the table. So, yeah, those are some of the. I think the takeaway here for everyone is for all those professional YouTube farmers out there, <laughs> plant first, YouTube second. <laughs> <laughs> I have no comment. <laughs> Thanks again to Matt and Hunter for joining us. We really appreciate you being here, all the work you're doing. Can't wait to hear what you have, what you talk to farmers about, because I'm sure there's an infinite amount of questions. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you guys.